Think Different Nation is brought to you by investout.net, where we connect homeowners who know that their homes could sell for more if renovated with investors who are interested in adding that value at no cost to you. Once the home is renovated, you as the homeowner sell the home and the investors make their profit from the increased value of the sale. Did you ever hear a fox playing? Did you know that that's one of a basic instinct that all mammals exhibit? As a matter of fact, we have quite a bit in common with the silver fox. Welcome to Think Different Nation. Question for you. How do you tame a human? Well, I think it takes one part early human, one part language, two parts culture, and five parts time. Hi, my name is Ty Glover and welcome to Think Different Nation. So, back to that question of how do you tame a human, or to put it in a different way, how do you feel about the domestication of humans? If you're brought into the idea that humans are just as much animals as any other living creature, then it should come not as much of a surprise or a leap of faith to you that at one time, we were just as wild as any other animal or primate. Beginning back somewhere in the area of 100,000 years ago, it's believed that Homo sapiens experienced some type of a transformation that allowed us to become what we are today, modern humans. There were many other humans that came and went before we emerged somewhere in the area of 200,000 years ago, but that first emergence of Homo sapiens, well, it yielded a different kind of a human. Anthropologists believe that the first sapiens had the same brains as we do. And visually, they were identical to us, but it's believed that that first sapien lacked one basic capability, their ability to communicate in complex messages. This first human, or rather Homo sapien, known as Cro-Magnum, according to Dr. Yaval Noah Harari, professor of the Department of History of Hebrew University, they were identical to us, but for some reason, the cake just wasn't fully baked as they left Africa and entered into Europe. It's believed that they were missing some primary cognitive capabilities. The first migration entered into Europe somewhere in the area of 100 to 70,000 years ago, and it failed. It failed as an experiment that ended with their extinction and with the Neanderthals and the other early humans winning out. Dr. Harari continues his thought with the fact that while these first sapiens had the ability to create language, theirs was different from ours, and they most likely would not have even been able to learn our language based on their structure and neither we theirs. Outside of that, they would have fit right in at any dinner party that we would have ever attended, of course, as a silent guest. But if we're humans, then, then what tamed us? How do we transition into being civilized, or rather a civilized species? The only way I could figure out how to explore this question was to study animal domestication. But considering the domestication of the dog to the wolf took roughly uh, 10,000 to 30,000 years. And I obviously don't have that type of time on my hands. So I went with an animal that was forced to domesticate and was studied with great detail to understand that process. Thus, the taming of the Siberian fox. The conception of this test began back in the 40s. Dr. Dmitry Konstantinovich Balayeva was a Russian geneticist who was interested in studying the behaviors and the characteristics of the domesticated animals but it was illegal in Russia at the time. So he needed to have a way to hide his research and what better way to do it than to have a fox farm for the production of foxes for their pelts for the fur industry. You see, the premise here was that he would select and breed the most common docile foxes and the ones that displayed aggression would be used for their pelts for the thriving fur industry. This provided natural cover for government investigators who sought and persecuted anyone who was not abiding by government regulations. Now, during that first selection of foxes for the breeding process, researchers sought simply one or two foxes that were the most approachable. This started back in the 1960s, and while most foxes would have instinctively growled and bared their teeth, the researchers looked for the least aggressive ones of the lot, and each year, that's exactly what they selected. Once the first litter emerged, it took two generations before the researchers recognize a subtle change in its offspring, with the most obvious being the fact that they were more approachable, more submissive as compared to the other foxes. This was apparent by 1962, or just two years following the start of the research. 
By the fourth generation, it was recognized that the selected offspring of the young foxes showed obvious signs of tail wagging similar to dogs when the researchers would appear. This was behavior that was uncommon to any other foxes and was visible just four years after beginning the experiment. So already you're seeing a transition of more passive behavior and a physical change in their characteristic. Additionally, young foxes, or rather kits as they're called, were docile enough to be picked up, petted, and they would whimper and show appreciation during the process, again, four years after they began this experiment. By 1966, or the sixth generation, the foxes were showing full affection for the researchers, and the most affectionate ones following up with licking of the caretakers when possible. By the ninth generation, or by 1969, the ears displayed differences when compared to the normal or the wild foxes. Normally the ears would stiffen just after the birth, but the test foxes, well they retained soft ears for three months after the birth. So there's an obvious transition from the wild fox to the more domesticated fox as they're on their road. Now at this point, there were obvious changes as well in the coats of the foxes being born with spotted fur and star shapes on their forehead. By the 13th generation, or rather by 1973, foxes' tails began to curl up when they came into contact with the humans as compared to the wild foxes whose tails pointed down upon contact. Now we've all seen a dog that was afraid and its tails point down whenever you approach them. But these tails, they would come up, they would wag. By the 15th generation, tails became shorter by roughly three to four vertebrae. That's a structural change in the body. And this occurred by 1975 or the fifth generation as mentioned. Now this first series of experiments lasted for roughly 15 years or 15 generations of forced selection. The journey of domestication of humans, however, lasted for far longer by some estimates as long as 600 paternal grandmothers across 40,000 years. So let's take a look back. If you consider going back to the emergence of modern man, it could have been as far back as 200,000 years ago, which would have been on par with roughly 2,000 paternal grandmothers if you're looking at a roughly a 40 to 50 year lifespan of a grandmother. And while the changes were significant from a modern sapient cognitive ability standpoint, the physical changes or rather the hardwiring changes were subtle, if recognizable at all. But over the course of the 15 years of the domestication of fox, they lost roughly three to four vertebrae during that short 15 year time span. That's a sizable structural change in their body, their physical form. It's a hardwiring change in such a short period of time. And these were not directed changes, meaning that these changes were not part of the researcher's intention. They weren't driving to create this. They just occurred based on the fox's evolutionary system of selecting specific traits, and for some reason, it led to these unintended changes. Now, if this were the case, then why would we not expect Homo sapiens to undergo an even more significant structural change, and at a minimum, our soft wiring, our instincts, across a 40 to 70,000 year period during our self-taming? What I believe happened is that humans, we began to leverage one of our truly different gifts that propelled us to our current position, our language. Now, saying this isn't at all groundbreaking because it is the common belief held by anthropologists. In fact, when you look at Homo sapien, no other animal has been able to express ideas or concepts, which leads to beliefs, ideology, myths, culture, and thus the entrance of the cognitive revolution. Now, why is this important? because we are also the only human and apex predators to be able to live in large groups. Being able to live with large groups is key to building civilizations and empires. Now that's according to Dr. Harare, as well as Artem Koren. He's the author of Untethered, Unraveling Human Nature Through Instinct, Culture, and Reason. It's a great read, by the way. But before we recognize this need, I believe we also recognize that there's safety in numbers. Maslow's hierarchy of needs suggests that the first things sapiens need are health, food, water, sleep, clothing, and shelter. This is very difficult to achieve, however, without a community, without differentiated members doing differentiated things. But how did we achieve safety? I mean, we're primates, and primates are violent creatures. 
We're a violent species, expressing numerous instances of genocide across our existence. And this is typical of primates. Jane Goodall spoke of this in her journals called the Gombe Chimpanzee Wars, where a group of chimpanzees split, causing one group to savagely target the smaller group for over a four-year period. During that conflict, researchers captured human, that is, very human behaviors of treachery, rage, celebration, and terror. You see, this disturbance led to a subsequent territorial disturbances with another group until the aggressive group finally withdrew back to its original area and thus it calmed the whole scenario. But nonetheless, it was expressed in earlier primates. You see, we're all humans with an instinctive quest for self or group preservation. This still drives us even today. Somewhere near 800,000 years ago, humans developed the ability to control fire. And that, many suggest, led to the cognitive revolution because we're able to now eat meat in a way that was more beneficial to our rapid and more effective processing of those energy sources. When you cook it, it becomes more refined, it becomes more digestible, and thus you can consume more energy from it versus eating vegetables or even plants or in fruit. There's less energy involved per inch, per mass. The ability to be able to eat cooked meat meant that it broke down and processed more quickly, which means that there was less time required on any given day to just satisfy Maslow's hierarchical need of sustenance. With this came a change in our jawbones and our jagged teeth becoming more smooth, as there was less need for us to be able to tear tough food products. This change took place over the next 600,000 years, and many anthropologists believe that this increase in our energy and efficiency in tasks led to an increased cognitive capability, as our intestinal tract also shrank because of the increased efficiency in the processing of the food. What does that translate to? More energy for brain development, which led to the cognitive revolution beginning as sapiens first exited Africa roughly 40,000 years ago. We call it Venture 2.0. Now. If the fox was able to lose three to four vertebrae across the 15 years of its forced domestication, then surely Homo sapien could have rewired our brains, could have restructured the way we do things and the way we think across 40,000 years as we migrated out of Africa. But how do we learn to not just harness fire, but rather create it? It was most likely learned through our 400,000 years of using it. I mean, we all know it's hot. A burned log will retain red hot embers for hours. Even the actual flame itself isn't present until it's blown on. And it can be reignited. But how does being able to control it translate to being able to create it? I'm sure this was no more complex for early sapiens than sapiens taking a piece of stone and for some reason striking it against another stone and seeing sparks appearing that looked identical to the sparks that emerged from the campfires that have been observed for thousands of years in the past. The thinking brain can easily make those connections. The forced evolution of the silver fox was something that also produced unintended consequences that led to the disappearing and the reappearing of physical traits across those 15 years. The researchers began to believe that when you drastically change a natural selection by selecting the breeding pairs themselves of the foxes, it also had unintended consequences that cannot be calculated. What was the consequences of taming fire? The ability to extend the day into the night that led to the presentation of myths, which led to rituals, which led to legends and ideology around common beliefs and stories. By learning how to harness fire, control fire, manage it, we radically change the pressures of our existence and shook everything up, leading to a whole suite of uncalculable changes to follow. We moved away from biology to instinct, exponentially towards think, innovate. This was a structural shift in our evolution, and it came to the right species at the right time. You see, sapiens are the only humans, or for that matter, animals that can form in large groups around abstract concepts and ideas. Dr. Harari phrases it best when he says, we come together for common causes, to fight ideologies different from ours, and to protect our territories based on lines drawn on our map. And as we migrated from hunter to gatherer, we became tame and we transitioned from biology to ideology. 
where thought drove our actions, considerations, and decisions. While many of our instincts are still yet to be discovered, our own bloodlines developed specific soft-wired instincts that were passed down through our lines, and many are available even today within us. It's up to us to identify what those individual instinctive advantages are. 19th century researcher James Rowan Angel suggested there were 15 common instincts that we all bear as mammals. Fear, anger, shyness, curiosity, affection, sexual love, jealousy and envy, rivalry, social ability, sympathy, modesty, play, imitation, constructiveness. And these are all exhibited across the board and typically within all mammals. For example, ants have been known and observed to play. And we've all seen the curiosity and shyness of a pet or the jealousy and envy that's experienced when someone else moves in on their territory. These are instincts that we all have as animals. Our job at Think Different Nation is to look at these types of instincts and wonder with you aloud. How do you experience these instincts? Do you experience them through your sight, through your sound, your touch, your smell, your taste? Because these are our primary senses through which we capture that information. Thank you for listening to How to Tame a Human, and always remember to think consciously.